Today, we are reporting from the 2020 ASCO Virtual Scientific Program. We have recapped some of the top news that have been presented during the conference, and soon we'll speak with Dr. Skip Burris, ASCO President, on the big takeaways from this year's meeting. Welcome to Enclave News Network, I'm Gina Columbus. In patients with biochemically relapsed prostate cancer, imaging with the PSMA targeting agent 18F-DCF-PYL PET-CT outperformed that of standard imaging modalities, such as bone scan, CT, MRI, and FDG PET in the phase three Condor trial. The study showed high specificity in detecting lymph node disease involvement and significant positive predictive value in the detection of metastatic disease. Updated findings from the phase three Keynote 426 combination of pembrolizumab and ixitinib continue to demonstrate a clinically significant improvement in progression-free and overall survival compared to sunitinib in patients with previously untreated advanced renal cell carcinoma. In the phase three Beacon CRC study, there continued to be an overall survival benefit for encarafenib plus cetuximab with or without binumetinib compared with cetuximab plus arenotecan containing regimens in patients with BRAF V600E mutated metastatic colorectal cancer. Pembrolizumab was found to improve progression through survival after subsequent therapy for patients with PDL1 positive relapse refractory head and neck squamous cell carcinoma compared with the standard extreme regimen, according to an analysis of the Keynote 048 trial. Moreover, pembrolizumab induced better PFS2 outcomes both as a single agent and in combination with chemotherapy. In melanoma, findings from a five-year analysis of the phase three COMBI-AD trial validated the long-term benefit of adjuvant dibrafenib and trametinib in patients with resected stage three BRAF V600E or K mutant melanoma. The four and five-year relapse free survival rates were 55% and 52% with the doublet therapy versus 38% and 36% with placebo. Also in melanoma, the combination of encarafenib and binimetinib demonstrated continued benefit in overall survival and progression-free survival for patients with BRAF V600 mutant melanoma, according to an updated analysis of the Columbus trial. In acute myeloid leukemia, phase one dose escalation findings showed that the bispecific T-cell engager AMG330 was safe and tolerable in treating patients with relapsed or refractory disease with cytokine release syndrome as the most frequent and expected adverse event. An ongoing study of CC92480 in combination with dexamethasone demonstrated favorable activity and safety data in patients with heavily pretreated relapse or refractory multimyeloma. In the phase one multicenter dose escalation trial, there was an overall response rate of 21.1%, with one complete response, six very good pressure responses nine partial responses, and four minimal responses. Teclistimab, known as JNJ64007957, appeared to be a safe and efficacious treatment for patients with relapse refractory multimyeloma. 21 out of 52 patients achieved a response per international myeloma working group criteria. The antibody drug conjugate famtrastuzumab DRX-TCAN and XKI demonstrated promising clinical activity in patients with HER2-positive metastatic colorectal cancer, as well as those with HER2-positive advanced gastric or gastroesophageal junction adenocarcinoma, as seen in the Destiny CRC01 and Destiny Gastric 01 studies, respectively. In lung cancer, the addition of dervalumab to standard chemotherapy continued to demonstrate an improvement in overall survival for patients with treatment-naive extensive stage small cell lung cancer as seen in updated results from the phase three Caspian study. After a median follow-up of 25.1 months, the median OS was 12.9 months among patients who received Dervalumab and EP, compared with 10.5 months for those who received EP alone. In the phase three BGB A317307 trial, combining the anti-PD-1 agent Tisalizumab with chemotherapy improved progression-free survival versus chemotherapy alone as a frontline treatment in Chinese patients with advanced squamous non-small cell lung cancer. For more coverage of the 2020 ASCO Virtual Scientific Program, please visit onclive.com. Well, we are here with Dr. Skip Burris, this year's ASCO president, who is also Chief Medical Officer at Sarah Cannon Research Institute. Hello, Dr. Burris. It is so nice to see you, even though it's virtual. Happy ASCO. Great to see you as well, thank you. Certainly unprecedented times, uh, first ever virtual meeting, but things uh, have gone well. 
It certainly has. It's been a great meeting. Obviously, we are here virtual this year because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Would you be able to maybe speak to ASCO's decision to go virtual and really tell us what you sought out to accomplish with the virtual meeting this year? Yes, you know, we, we were trying to be uh, safe. We were trying to also satisfy our members. Some th folks thought we went a little bit late to make the decision to cancel. But on the other hand, you know, things were moving full speed in February and over just a few weeks, which seemed like a long time, we saw a dramatic change in how COVID was affecting the world. A big part of ASCO is education, but the other big part is connections and uh, bringing the 40,000 people together in Chicago. Our consistent feedback is this is the once in a year opportunity where everybody gets to see each other. So it was a very, very careful decision. I think the other smart point, credit to the staff, was to separate the scientific and the educational meetings. So we're doing science this weekend and the educational program the first weekend in August. Uh, it's important to get the clinical trial results out pharma biotech, investigators, patients, all the, the factors around the trial results are key. And then we can be a little more relaxed about the educational lectures. Uh, and actually it might be nice to actually have the educational lectures incorporate what we have learned this weekend from the scientific sessions. Those are some great points, thank you so much. Now, what would you say have been some of the biggest themes of this year's meeting? So this year's meeting, and it actually fell together nicely. A year ago, plotting my presidential theme, um, going around and around, wanting it to be impactful, Unite and Conquer, Accelerating Progress Together. My scientific program chair, Dr. Melissa Johnson, did a fabulous job. And a couple of the themes were really incorporating all aspects of the care system into the conference. So we actually have a number of speakers from uh, the regulatory agencies, we have academia and community oncologists speaking, uh, we've got uh, FDA, we've got uh, some pharma biotech. Uh, it's really been unique in that regard. And this is all talking about bringing that together to in fact accelerate some of these trial results. We are quickly learning that cancer is a story of subsets of patients, less common malignancies, uh, even rare tumors. And I think the theme is that we're making giant strides in small areas of cancer one step at a time. And that has been pervasive throughout many of the presentations. Absolutely. Now there's obviously been so much research that has come out over this weekend. Could you shed light on what you think have really been some of the biggest abstracts? Yes, uh, in the, we have had the last 10 years really seen a growth in immunotherapy and in precision medicine, the small molecules, the oral drugs that target mutations. And what we're seeing at this meeting is many of those agents moving from the relapse refractory setting into first line adjuvant neoadjuvant trials. So that's been quite encouraging. We are seeing uh, in the plenary presentation the results of bringing immunotherapy into the frontline setting in a subset of colon cancer patients. So that was an important presentation with pembrolizumab in the MS High group. Uh, in the story of avelumab and bladder cancer. We have struggled with how best to incorporate immunotherapy into bladder cancer. And this precedent setting trial design of utilizing avelumab in the maintenance setting drastically improves survival. And then quickly move to the rare tumor, gestational trophoblastic tumors are very rare, usually curable with a drug as simple as methotrexate in these women. And yet we found that in that small portion that don't respond, Avelumab was very successful, and just as an anecdote, mentioned was that one woman actually was able to get pregnant and have a child after being treated in that study. So really, really amazing. And then we saw the small molecules make an impact in pediatric tumors. Uh, excellent presentations about some of the less common pediatric tumors, sarcomas and the like. Um, so seeing the, the pill therapy move into that setting was certainly very, very attractive. And then I'll just make a quick comment. Other place for precision therapy was the use of tacatinib, the oral HER2 agent in women with brain metastases from breast cancer. Just another subset that so desperately needed new options. Thank you so much. That's some great insight. Now, obviously, and, and you alluded to this already, there is a lot of um, emerging targets coming down the oncology pipeline. Are there any of these um, 
kind of um, earlier phase studies that you think could maybe gain a lot of traction this year? And, and also off of that as well, are there any research that perhaps you were authored on or that you're working on currently that you would like to highlight? Yes, great question. Uh, absolutely a fabulous session we saw that looked at uh, immunotherapy moving beyond the checkpoint inhibitors. And so we saw a number of approaches to cellular therapies that looked very, very attractive in a variety of different tumor types. Some of the squamous cell cancers that are affected through HPV and some of the other subsets of patients that seem to benefit from cellular therapy. So Cellular therapy, uh, just a, a broad phrase to describe so many new agents that are using that approach, another way of using our immune systems to help treat cancers. Really, really fabulous data. We also saw information on new directions in hormonal therapy. We're continuing through chemistry and development to have better drugs that block hormone receptors, both in prostate cancer and in breast cancer. That is something where those two very common malignancies and the majority of patients with breast and prostate cancer can benefit from hormonal therapy. We at Sarah Can have proudly been, been involved in those studies and then actually to see that play out uh, in some of these trials. So that, that's a really great advance, a very straightforward, well-tolerated approach to treating these cancers. And then we continue to see data looking at a variety of the subsets of tumors with very less common mutations, very one percentish, but to see that with MET and RET and ROS, uh, continue to see new agents, again, through chemistry, better and better versions of those molecules, and certainly the future's bright. And then I'd be remiss not to mention uh, the osimertinib study. So that adjuvant trial in lung cancer, uh, worth going back, re-reviewing that, Everybody's always a little anxious when a trial stops early. Are we going to get all the results? Um, there was a lot of chatter about the fact that it was disease-free survival versus overall survival. But boy, those curves are so separated. I've told many people, it reminds me of trastuzumab uh, 20 years ago in the adjuvant therapy of breast cancer. And I think when you're talking about the potential to really put patients in remission for a long time, we've got to get that data out there and have the investigators and the regulatory bodies and the researchers really understand next steps. That's some really wonderful insight, Dr. Burris. Thank you. Now, obviously, we are in a very challenging time, of, especially from a global scale with COVID-19. And the um, CCC-19 registry was also presented at ASCO this year, some really interesting data. Would you be able to maybe speak to the importance of this initiative and maybe some of the trends that um, the data are uh, suggesting? Yes, yeah, a really wonderful effort. And it was great, uh, Dr. Warner's presentation on CCC-19, Dr. Horn talking about the smaller registry, TerraVolt with patients with thoracic malignancies, mostly lung cancers. Dr. Sharpless leading off that session with his thoughts, and then Dr. Siligliana from Italy um, doing a nice job comparing the experience from Italy, which was really one of the harder hit places. I think not a lot of surprises there. It just told us that the oncologists and the cancer patients have to be very concerned and very aggressive about how they approach this. We know that COVID-19 causes a much more severe pneumonia than we've seen with other types of viral illnesses. And thus, those patients with lung cancer, smoking histories, prior thoracic uh, cancers all had a, a more difficult time. Uh, the older patients, not surprising, more vulnerable in terms of uh, being affected by COVID-19. But really key to get it out there and discuss it as we think about trying to get back to work in oncology and what's that new normal going to look like. And then last I'll just mention it was picked up by a lot of the press and you can't ignore it, hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin. So that much talked about drug combination uh, in the CCC-19 registry, patients that took that combination did statistically worse than patients that did not. And again, only a thousand patients uh, in that particular registry, but important to talk about the fact that we really need to be careful about off-label usage in that setting. More registries are ongoing. Uh, uh, the ASCO registry has begun. That'll be a, a little different because that'll be a series of longitudinal reports uh, that'll come out about what's going on as we continue through the year with uh, the practices having to look at handling COVID-19 in their various scenarios. 
definitely. Now, uh, ASCO has also put out some resources and recommendations that um, can be used for physicians to help manage their patients with cancer who have COVID-19. Uh, would you be able to highlight some of those recommendations that they've been able to put in place? Yes, um, so great resources at ASCO.org and cancer.net, ASCO.org for the healthcare professionals and cancer.net for the patients. Um, again, it's clear and I think important to point out that the simple steps of greater personal hygiene, hand washing, social distancing, and uh, the wearing of masks really has made a difference. I think the most important part of that that's really played out is the surprisingly low percentage of healthcare workers and of uh, healthcare professionals within oncology programs that have been infected with COVID-19. So sort of the, the way to make the statement that these steps really, really do work. I think it's also continued for us to push up on the aspect of modernizing the clinical trial process. So telehealth has come on very quickly. And we uh, at Sarah Cannon and many other centers have been using telehealth to keep track of our study patients. We've been shipping pills to patients. We've been having the patients get local labs. And really when we stop and think about it, we should do more of that. Taking the trials to the patients is something that I mentioned in my presidential speech. And uh, there's a lot of synergy in Washington with ASCO, FDA, CMS, to really try to modernize this process and have more patients participate. But there's many resources on that website. It's really worth taking a look. And in particular, drive your patients to get some of their questions answered. Thank you, Dr. Burris. Any kind of closing remarks about this year's meeting and looking ahead to uh, what's to come at future ASCO meetings that you'd like to share? So unprecedented times, uh, certainly didn't plan to be the president of the first ever virtual meeting. Uh, credit to all of the individuals who came together to make it happen. Um, it's been interesting with, such as we're doing the Zoom talk now, some of the social media. Um, it's been interesting to hear people talk about how connected they feel. So we've been uh, chatting. There's been some live chats during several of the broadcast sessions. Uh, it, it's gotten people more comfortable with it. Uh, at the other time, there's a lot of folks craving to get back to Chicago and to see each other. But I firmly believe we will probably see blended meetings in the future, not just ASCO, but around the world. Um, I think the success of the virtual meeting is going to say that should be a component and it'll enable those people who can't travel to Chicago um, to be able to participate more fully. Um, and we'll just sort of have to see. This is really, we're entering to the new normal of how we're going to not only approach patient care, but how we handle medical meetings. So uh, it was a monumental effort, over 250 oral presentations, 2,500 poster presentations. Quick comment there, people have liked the fact that they can be more casual about looking at a poster as opposed to having to go through the hall and you know get that three hour window. So there's been some positives. Uh, I did a little podcast with David Henry from Penn who titled it Making uh, Lemonade Out of Lemons and that has sort of caught on. But uh, credit to the ASCO staff and all the volunteers on the Scientific Program Committee for pulling this off. But uh, despite the trying times, I think it's been a very successful meeting. And most importantly, the education's been done, the results have been presented, and we're moving on in the uh, efforts of cancer research. That's wonderful. Dr. Burris, thank you so much for being on with us today. Congratulations to a very successful meeting, a virtual meeting as well. And we hope to see you soon, hopefully in person. Thank you, Gina. Always a pleasure to talk with you. Oh, you too. Thank you. That's all for today. It has been a pleasure having you on with us for Enclave News Network on location at the 2020 ASCO Virtual Scientific Program. Thank you for watching Enclave News Network. I'm Gina Columbus.